Okay, we're going to do a study today, tonight, on centurions in the Bible. Not really a big subject, but it is a subject, and an interesting subject to study. Now, a centurion is among the Romans, a military officer, a command of a hundred men. And today you would liken him to a captain in the modern military. So Matthew chapter 8, Matthew chapter 8, and verse number 5. And when Jesus, here's our main subject, a man above all men. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there were come unto him a centurion. And that's the first time that word shows up in our Bible. There. Beseech him. That's the first time that word shows up. So here comes the centurion. Here comes Jesus. And he beseeched him. He got a, de a desired request of Jesus. And he comes purposely to seek Jesus. And Jesus said to him, oh, wait, excuse me, verse 6, and saying, Lord, here's a guy, a military commander, a captain, and he walks up to Jesus and he says, Lord, my servant lies at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. His servant, not his wife, not a child, not himself, but his servant, one that takes care of this man. This man is at home. He's got the palsy. He's grievously tormented. And this centurion comes out and comes to Jesus and addresses him as Lord. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. And the centurion answered, and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou should come under my roof. Jesus said, okay, I, I hear your situation. I see your troubles. I see your problems. Let's go. And the centurion is like, oh, whoa, stop. This Lord that I call you Lord is not just a title of respect. But this centurion is acknowledging Jesus who he is. And when Jesus says, I will come, this Roman Gentile tells Jesus, no, 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 wait a minute. You're not worthy to come into my house. You are not worthy. Thou shouldst come under my roof, but speak the word only. And my servant shall be healed. Now look at the faith. This is not just Lord Jesus, my sweet Jesus. Jesus, how wonderful you are. Jesus. No. This guy has faith in Jesus, the Lord Jesus, that he has power to heal his servant. And for Jesus to come under his roof, into his house. Jesus, you're too wonderful to do that. That's a remarkable statement by this centurion. The first centurion in the Bible. It is so remarkable. For I am a man under authority. So he commands a hundred men, but he himself has people over him. I am a man under authority. Okay, I have a charge. Having soldiers under me, about a hundred. And I say to this man, go. <coughs> And he goeth. Obedience. Obedience. Excuse my throat. Yeah. Obedience. Here's a guy. He's got men. He's got faithful men. And they do what they tell you to do. And to another come. And he cometh. And to my servant, do this. And he doeth it. Well, he's got men in his charge that whatever he says, he's the boss. 
How you doing, Christian? Your boss tell you to do something? It was not my job. I don't get paid that much. Union says I don't. And when Jesus heard it, now verse 9, a guy is not bragging. He's not high on himself. He's not lofty. He's saying, Jesus, this is my standing. This is who I am. I've got men under me that are obedient. Who am I that you would come to me, come to my house? And Jesus heard it and marveled. Jesus marveled. This guy, this Gentile, has marveled God manifest in the flesh. And said unto them that followed, which would be Jews and Gentiles, but Jews. Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. That's a bold statement. Jesus got in trouble making this kind of statement to his own hometown. When he says, name in the Syrian was his leprosy. And the widow that, that helped Elijah. Both of them Gentiles. And speaking to Jewish people, man, they were ready to kill him. They tossed him out of the city, literally. And here he stops the crowd of people, mostly Jews following. He says, you know what? Of you, the nation of Israel, I have found faith, not in you, but in this Gentile. That didn't cause a ruckus. And that didn't get some people upset. And I say unto you that many, many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Those are Jewish. That is a Jewish breed. There is the Jewish foundation of the nation of Israel. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out unto utter, utter darkness. And they shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's hell. He addressed to the nation of Israel. You know, you may be of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You may be the ones of the, of the promised land given to you by your fathers, by God Almighty. But you know what? You're going to go to hell. If you don't do what the Word of God says, you don't put your faith that I am the Messiah, you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not going to a kingdom. You're going to hell. As John the Baptist say, he that has the Son has everlasting life. He that has not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abiding upon him. He stopped the whole congregation for a Gentile, and he tells those, those Jewish people, hey, this Gentile has a faith that you don't have. And your lack of faith will get you a gnashing of teeth and darkness, and that is hell. That is the wrath of God. What would Jesus do? That's not what Jesus would do when people come up when we preach on the streets. And Jesus said it to the centurion. Now, what did he say to the Jewish people? I have found not so great faith, no, not in Israel, that many shall come from the east and west, shall sit down to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast in the outer darkness and shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That is addressed to his people, to Jewish people, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What's he say to this, this dog, this Gentile? Go thy way. And as thou hast believed, there's the faith, Verse 10, great faith, believe, so be it, that's so be it, that's amen. So be it done unto thee, and the servant was healed in the same, self-same power. Well, how's that? Even the time of the Jewish, of, of the children of Israel, here is a centurion, comes up to God, shows respect to God, believes in what, see, his belief was, just say the word. No signs. Now signs are for the Jews, 1 Corinthians one twenty one. But signs are not for the for the Gentiles. And this and this gentleman says, Jesus, stop. 
stuff. You're not going to my house. I'm not worthy to have you. Just speak the word. There's no reason for you to make extra steps. There's no reason for you to step into my house because the Gentiles are not favorable with the Jews. And if you come into my house, they're going to get mad at you. Listen, they, we're going to look at Acts chapter 10, but they got angry with Peter when he went to a, to a Gentile house. According to the Holy Spirit. This guy who is a soldier does not want conflict. And Jesus acknowledges his faith and his belief and acknowledges to the Jewish people, you're lacking. You're lacking. Now let's take Matthew 27, 54. That's a remarkable centurion. We'll come back to that in a moment, but Matthew 27, 54. Matthew 27, 54. And we'll look at uh, verse 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Jesus has died. He is risen. You can see the sign behind me. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. The rocks were split in half. And the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints, many, not all, which slept arose. Resurrection. And came out of the graves after his resurrection, three days and three nights later, and went into the holy city, Jerusalem, and peered unto many, but not all. Now when the centurion, here we go, and they that were with him, Jesus, Watching Jesus. Here's a centurion. He's at the, at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He is there with Jesus. He is watching Jesus. Saw the earthquake. And those things that were done. And they feared greatly. A lot of those Jews walked away that day. A lot of them did not walk away in fear. They walked away. He's dead. Finally got rid of them. Let's go set up the Passover. Feared greatly, saying, truly, this was, that's the problem, the Son of God. Now to him it was, was. He didn't say is or am. To him, the Son of God died on that cross. It's over with. It's done. And you got to wonder with this centurion here, because look, look at Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15, verse 39. We'll start in 37. Mark 15, 37. Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion which stood over against him, Jesus, you know what the centurion heard before Jesus died? He heard the conversation of repentant thief and Jesus himself. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Those words were probably understood and heard at the position of the centurion. He's close enough to read, King of the Jews. Which stood over against him, saw that he, yeah, excuse me, against him, Jesus, saw that he, Jesus, so cried out and gave up the ghost. This guy saw Jesus die. Now, you think that Jesus did not die. Here's a Roman soldier that says he died. And he said, truly this man, this man, Christ, was again the son of God. He's acknowledging was, but Jesus, the man that died on that cross, the Son of God. And as far as he sees what we're seeing right now, it was, it's not no longer, because he died. 
And there are people out there who teach that Jesus did not die. This centurion says, well, there he is. He died. It's over with. It's gone. But he died. He would not say was if there was no death. The Roman centurion here, the first part of the gospel that Jesus Christ suffered and died, is a proven fact not only with the Jewish people, but with the Roman centurion right there watching that the Holy Spirit has given us insight of what he said. You know, of all the things that were spoken in the Bible, what conversation did Adam and Eve have after Genesis 3? What did Cain and Abel talk about after God received Abel's offering and did not receive Cain's offering? Of all the words that we do not see, that the Holy Spirit did not want us to know. He wanted us to know these words of the centurion. You got to wonder what happened to him. You got to wonder. I'm not going to say nothing. But Luke 23. Luke 23. I'm not going to go into what I think the scriptures did. I'm going to say what the scriptures say. We got a wonderful testimony. 23:47, And we'll look at 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, God, into thy hands, God's hand, I commend my spirit. That's the first time that word commend shows up. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. He's dead. Now when the centurion saw what was done, what did he say? He saw the earthquake. He saw the rocks red. He saw the conversation between him and the repentant thief. He saw and heard the prayer of Jesus to God. He saw a lot. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, certainly this was a righteous man. Glorified God. Acknowledge Jesus is a righteous man. That there was no fault found in him. That's what he's saying. He's saying Jesus Christ died on that cross and there, there was no crime against him. Okay. He also glorified God in the death of Jesus Christ. You got to want to have what happened three days and three nights later. What do you think? I don't know. It's not recorded. It's not recorded. He could have stayed as a, as a Roman. This, okay, God and rejected Jesus. As any Catholic would do. But he acknowledges he's the son of God. Now, did he believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved? After the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We don't know. So let's look at Mark 15, 44. Mark 15, 44. And we'll start in 43. Joseph of Armenia an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went boldly unto Pilate, that's the Roman leader of Jerusalem, and craved, that's the only place that word shows up, got a craving, the body, the dead body of Jesus. The body of Jesus. He says, Pilate, yes, sir, can I have that body of Jesus? And Pilate marveled, as if he were already dead. Yes, you didn't die that quick. Pilate was not at the cross. Pilate could not sing at the cross, at the cross. He wasn't there. He did not witness the execution that he had ordered for Jesus Christ. And calling unto him the centurion, the not a centurion, the centurion. I said, if I were right now, if we were at a grocery store, I'd say, well, go out there 
and find me a red car and put this gospel track on that red car. How many red cars would you find? If I were to say, go in the parking lot, find the red car and point or call. All right, it's a specific red car. There could be Fords, Pontiacs, Chryslers, Cadillacs, red cars. But if I say the red car, well, it's got to limit down. It's got to be a make, model, and possibly a year. Possibly, you know, is it a two-door or four-door? And he says, does Centurion. I'm going to speculate. And this is not doctrine. Because there are probably many Centurions in the Roman army. But would this possibly be Matthew 27, 54? Mark 15, 39? Luke 23, 47? Possible? There was one, one centurion that the Holy Spirit said, I saw Jesus die. I saw what he did. I witnessed the conversation between him and the dying thief. I witnessed the conversation he had with the Father. He stood over. He might have been the centurion that was in charge of that body, Jesus, to be crucified. You better make sure he don't come off that cross. You better make sure no one takes him down off that cross. You better make sure he ends up on that cross. They may have centurions for each of the bodies to be crucified. I don't know. But Pilate said, the centurion. And he asked him whether he, had, whether he had been any while dead. And when he knew it of the centurion, he gave the body of Joseph. Here's another confirmation that people say Jesus didn't die. Joseph goes up to Pilate. Pilate, I like the body of Jesus. Joseph said the body is dead. Pilate's like, I, I, I don't know. It's dead already? Centurion, come here. The centurion, come here. Jesus died? He's dead? Officially declared dead? Yeah? All right, Joseph, he's dead. You can have the body. So what we see with the centurion, we see the gospel that Jesus Christ suffered and died according to the scriptures. We have verification where some people out there say he did not die. That the resurrection is when his cold body hit the stone in the cave. Boing, it woke him up like an ice pack. So the centurion approves to us and affirms to us before his boss and his leader of his nation. It'd be like an army or marine or navy, coast guard or air force captain of the military go up not to the president not to the king but go up to the vice president of the united states say we affirm that this man that you wanted and then fill in the blanks he's been captured he's been killed or he's been excommunicated this centurion walks up to the leader of the nation says you prescribed that man to die on that cross you gave the charge to be crucified. I am here to affirm to you to tell you that he died. Interesting. Now, would you call that the centurion Matthew 27, Mark 15, and Luke 23? I'm not going to go that far to say, but it <laughs> will know in glory. There's a possibility. Listen. Anybody who gets saved, anyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to see them in glory. If this man received Jesus Christ as his Savior, we'll let him tell us the story. If he did not receive Jesus Christ and he only glorified God and then glory to death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, he's in hell. Watching Christ died, if he did not believe on that, he's in hell. You can believe in God. You can believe Jesus is the Son of God, but you don't believe in the, in the gospel. You don't believe that it's only by Jesus Christ and nothing else. He that received not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abiding upon him. Now Luke 7. Luke 7. I'm sorry if I sound stuffy and it's late and if it seems dark. Dude, this is a terrible, 
Yeah, it is. Luke 7, 1. Now, when he, Jesus, had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered the Capernaum. Okay, that goes back to Matthew 8. And a certain centurion servant. Now, here's the trouble. In Matthew 8, it says the, the centurion came to Jesus. Luke tells us the servant. Who was dear unto him. A certain centurion servant. Okay, this is the one that's sick. Who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. In M Matthew chapter 8, it says palsy and tormented in pain. When he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him Jesus, the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. Now, here, the centurion knocks on the door of the Jewish people, because this is a Jewish Messiah. He's a Gentile. Will you go get your Jewish Messiah and bring him to me? I'm a Gentile. I'm not worthy. And he said, beseech him that he would come and heal his servant. Come, bring him. Come him over here. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly. The only other time that word shows up is Acts 26, 7. That's the first time. There's only two places in the Bible. Saying that he was worthy of whom he should do this. He, the centurion, was worthy of whom Jesus should do this. The Jews came up to Jesus saying, listen, we got this request from the centurion. This guy is worthy. We're going to speak for this Gentile. For he, the centurion, loveth our nation. I will bless them that bless you. And has built us a synagogue. Oh, ho, look at this Roman guy. He builds a meeting place for the Jewish people. Then Jesus went with them, the Jewish people. And when he was now not far from the house, he's coming. Tell Jesus to come and heal my servant to the Jewish people. The centurion sent friends to him. Now in Mark, Matthew chapter 8, it's all the centurion dealing with Jesus. Here he sends friends. The centurion sends his friends. Saying unto him, Jesus, Lord, there's that Lord again, trouble not thyself. For I am not worthy that thou should enter under my roof. Matthew 8. Jesus is coming. Oh, oh, you two, come here. What? Go tell Jesus, stop. No, no, no. He's not. I had to send Jewish people because we're Gentiles. We're Gentiles. We're dead dogs. We're, we're, we're miserable of miserable. The Lord is not willing. I mean, no, the Lord's not willing. I was going to quote scripture there. Sorry. The Lord, I am not worthy for the Lord to come. Don't have him come any further. Please. I'm not worthy. Wherefore, neither, uh, neither thought I myself, but forgive me, should enter into my robe. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. I am not only not worthy to have you under my house, I am not worthy to come to you. Here is the guy that, that comes up to Jesus, smokes his breath, and won't look up and say, Lord, have mercy on me. I'm not even worthy to look up. Jesus is not worthy to come under my house, in my house, around my house, and I am a Gentile. I am not worthy even to come up to Jesus. This guy is humble. This guy is acknowledging Jesus, who he is. And none of these centurions. Man, they just are humble. Oh, 
but say in a word, in a word, and my servant shall be healed. Look at look at that faith. Just speak the word. As much as you said, let there be light, let there be the sun, let there be earth, let there be water, let there be a cow, let there be a rhinoceros, let there be man. Let this guy be healed. I don't have that much faith. For I am also a man set under authority, having under me soldiers, and I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and another come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth. Those are the same exact words in Matthew 8. Listen, I'm an unsaved man. I'm an unsaved Gentile. I tell them to go, I tell them to do, I tell them to sit, and they do it. You are not worthy to come here. I may give commands, but you are the Lord. And when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. There's that marveling again. Now, how do you explain the Jewish people coming? How do you explain his friends? I can't. I can't. I'm not going to give you answers to make me think myself important, make you think I, I don't have all the answers. And I'm not going to lie to you. And if you're going to turn off this video because he doesn't know the, between Matthew 8 and, and Luke chapter 7, you go off and be foolish. I don't know. I was not there. I'm only going by what the Holy Spirit has recorded to us. So here's that marveling. And turn him, Jesus, about and said to the people that follow him, there's the Jewish people. The Jewish people were sent by the, centur uh, the centurion. Hey, you people are Jewish. Go to your Jewish Messiah. Go to the Jewish Lord. I need him to, to help my servant. And as these Jewish men are walking with Jesus to the centurion's house, Jesus stops and does about face and starts directing them. And he's going to talk to the Jewish people that was sent by the centurion and those that were following him. I say unto you, Jewish people and anybody else, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. That's an insult. That is, he came unto his own, his own received him not. Do you see why? That is a very kick in the britches for a Jewish person to have their Messiah come up and say, you guys are not faithful. That Gentile over there? Now he's got, no, no, no. He doesn't have faith. He has great faith. Oh. Man, if you were to have a preacher say that out of the pulpit in the church house, there would be nobody ever to come back in the next week. If that preacher would point you out and say, hey, you guys right there in this church, you're not as faithful as that man over there. And honestly, honestly, Bill, say that. They wouldn't come back. They'd go find a church where they would be praised. And their, their hymn would be how great I am. You know what the, the centurion, you know what his hymn is? How great thou art. And they that were sent, those are Jewish men back in verse number three. They that were sent returning to the house found the servant whole that had been sick. So Jesus obeyed the, the centurion. He didn't go. Centurion said, don't come. Jesus, okay. But the healing took place by the faith of that centurion. Now, what would have happened that centurion said, Lord, you know, just come. Well, all you got to do is say the word. Jesus would have came and spoke the word. And the thing is, if you tell Jesus not to come, he's not going to come. You don't ask Jesus, you're not going to get if it's good for you. We ask, we receive not because we ask not, James says. People told Jesus, get out of here. We don't want to see you. We don't have anything to do with you. He's like, okay, bye. See you. So, 
Acts chapter. Oh boy, um, let's go about this way, then we'll come back. Acts chapter 21, verse 31. You got a long one coming up. Acts 21. I hope that's 31. I got bad handwriting. Acts 21, 31. And when and as they were about to kill, this is Paul, him, tidings came unto the chief captain of the band. So here's a here's a military leader. That all Jerusalem was in uproar. Uh oh, they're they're fighting. There's there's a riot. Who immediately took soldiers and centurions. That's the first time that word shows up. This is centurions and plural. So we've got more than a hundred. We got more than two hundred. While the Jews are trying to kill Paul. How angry is this crowd against Paul? You bring at least 200 men and their leaders. That's a lot. And ran down onto them while they saw the chief captain and soldiers. They left beaten off Paul. So these military men, Paul was stopped from being beaten by the Jews. Now we're going to start seeing centurion showing up in the ministry of Paul and the gospel that being preached around Paul. Somewhere along the time, you know, when things quiet down, this attorney would be like, Paul, why did this happen? Because I preached Jesus. The Jews are against Jesus. I preached the resurrection. I preached the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. And this is what they're giving me. I've started churches. This is Paul's personal testimony. Chapter 22, 25. We'll see this. 22, 25. 22, 25. And as they bound him with throng, Paul said to the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that's a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he was told the chief captain, his boss, the centurion's boss, Say, take heed what thou doest, for this man's a Roman. Paul looks at him, hey, listen, you're about to beat me. You just tied me up. I'm a Roman citizen. And which you could not beat Roman citizens. The centurion knew the law. The centurion knew the ways of the Romans. Paul was open on his conversations with the centurions. I guarantee the way Paul was, he... I'm not going to quote this verse complete, but he said, listen, I, I, I've dealt with everybody. I'm not guilty of the blood. When Paul would have an opportunity, I would believe he witnessed to these centurions. Or at least they heard about Paul and why Paul would be beaten. Why Paul would cause such a ruckus. Because he preached this man, Jesus. 23, 17. Then Paul called one of the centurions unto him. There's, there's multiple ones. He said, bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he has a certain thing to tell him. Paul's nephew has gotten word that these men have bound themselves with an oath. They're going to fast. They're going to tri trick the Roman government to think, hey, if you bring Paul to us, but in real reality, they want Paul dead. They're going to kill Paul by trickery. And Paul's nephew comes up and says, Paul, this is what they plan to do. Pa Paul calls up the centurions. He says, this, this young lad has something to say. So evidently, Paul is in communication and knows centurions that he can call them and say, hey. I mean, you think the centurions would have anything to do with a prisoner? I'll just shut up and sit in your cell. Will you? Stop bugging me. No, they listen. They listen. Verse 23. And he called unto him two centurions, saying, Make ready 200 soldiers. There you go. 200 soldiers, two centurions, to go to Caesarea and horsemen, three score and ten, and spearmen, 200, at the third hour of the night. That's 472 soldiers. What are they doing? They're getting Paul out of town because someone wants him dead. 
So when Paul is with this group of people, don't you think he's talking to centurions and these men that he can tell them about the gospel of Jesus Christ? I mean, if you're going to be involved in any way with Paul, whether he's on a missionary journey or he's bound in prison or bound in chains, whatever he is, I guarantee where Paul is, you've heard somehow about the gospel of Jesus Christ and how to be saved. How's that? Uh, 24, 23. And he commanded Saturnian to keep Paul and to let him have liberty, that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or come unto him. Now here is a centurion put in charge with Paul. This is your, you're in charge of Paul. Paul can have liberty. His people can come and visit him. Now don't you think that that centurion, now it says a centurion, it doesn't say the centurion, like we looked at before in the Gospels. Don't you think that centurion heard about the gospel? Don't you think he got the life of a Christian? Don't you saw what Christianity was truly about? I bet he did. I bet he did. 27.1. Acts 27.1. And was determined that we should sail unto Italy. They delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustus band. So here's a, I was going to say earlier, and I stopped. No centurions were named. Here is one centurion, and he's of the Augustus band, and his name is Julius. But, verse 3, next day we touch at Sinai, and Julius, courteously, that's the only time that word shows up, one of the words that's showing up for the first time, entreated Paul and gave him liberty, ooh, does that sound familiar? To go unto his friends and refresh himself. That sound familiar? And verse 10. And he said to Paul, Sir, I perceive that this voyage will be with her. It's going to be a shipwreck and much damage, not only to the lady in the ship, but also our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and owner of the ship more than those things were spoken by Paul. That is not too good. The centurion didn't believe Paul what he said. And I don't think he would not believe Paul and believe Paul on, on Jesus Christ and the resurrection and the salvation than not believe Paul about shipwreck. But then again, I don't know. I don't know what the mind and heart of the centurion was. But he believed the, the shipmen and he believed the, the, the boatmen more than he believed the apostles. So that's not very good. Verse 6. Oh yeah, we just did that. So now let's go to Acts chapter 10, verse 1. This is quite lengthy. Acts 10, 1. There was a certain man of Caesarea called Cornelius. A centurion. So here's a second. Second centurion that's named. Of the band called the Italian band. Here's the Italian. A devout man. And one that feared God. And all his house. Which gave much alms to the people. And prayed to God always. Boy, this centurion. One guy built a center God. This one gave him money. But this centurion here is not safe. You can be a devout man. You can fear God. You can give money. You can pray to God always and not be saved. This is religion. And he saw the vision evidently. It's the first time that word showed up. And the only other place it shows up is Galatians 3.1. About the ninth hour of the day. An angel of God coming into him, saying unto him, Cornelius. He sees an angel, and he's still lost. 
And we looked on him, him, angel, him, and was afraid. And said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thy alms are come up to the memorial before God. So can an unsaved man pray and God hear? Absolutely. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do, because you're not saved. And when an angel comes to your house and visits you somewhere, an angel cannot tell you how to get saved. An angel will tell you, whereby you can be entertained by angels unawares in Hebrew. If an angel comes to you, an angel is going to tell you, go get a Bible-believing Christian, and he will tell you the way of salvation. So Cornelius sends for, for Peter as the angel. He's obedient to the angel, and he's still lost. So Peter has his dream. We're not going to look at that. Peter says, okay, let's go. And Peter shows up at Cornelius' house. Verse 24. And the morrow after they entered the Caesarea, Cornelius waited for them. And I called together his kinsmen and near friends. Look at this. Look at this centurion. The angel said, go get Peter. Peter's got something important for you to say. This centurion calls all his family and friends together. There was a centurion that cared so much for his servant that Jesus to heal him. Man, these military leaders, they seem to care for people. They seem to love people. They seem to help where they can do. But they're lost. And Peter was coming in. Cornelius met him, fell down at his feet, and worshipped him. Here comes Peter. Cornelius hits the ground and starts, Oh, the Pope, oh, the Pope, oh, the Pope. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself, and also a man. That man is worshipping Peter and says, get, get up, get up. No, we don't do man worship here. I am not the Pope. You do not kiss my ring. You do not bow down before me. Get up. As he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. He said, you know how that is unlawful lawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come into another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. And that's what the satirian was back in the gospel. Jesus, you're not worthy. You're not supposed to be in the Gentiles' house. And the Jewish people know it. Please don't come. Just speak the word. So 34. I hope you read the rest of this chapter on your own. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, of, God, of truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Gentile or Jew, Jew or Gentile. But in every nation, he that feareth him, Cornelius, and worketh righteousness is accepted with him, the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is the Lord of all. That word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea, and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, that was on the cross. This is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. The centurions would have read that. It is common knowledge that Peter said throughout Jerusalem, throughout this region, Jesus Christ was preached. The Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all these things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. That would bring a satirian memory. There were centurions there at the cross. Pilate wasn't, but the centurions were. And I wonder in the groupings of the centurions, I wonder if these centurions, when they got in their groups, and say, hey, how was it that day when Jesus died on that cross? Tell me, the centurion, how was it? 
Hey, I heard because when Jesus died on the cross, I heard you actually got to go walk up to Pilate and tell Pilate that Jesus was dead. Man, how was that? Imagine when they got together, or whatever, however they got together. I heard you had that that paw with you. How, what was all that like? That holy roller. I bet you centurions had stories. And we are witness of all these things which he did both in the land of the Jews and Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on the tree. And him God has raised on the third day and showed him openly. There's the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 42, and he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that is he which is ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and dead, capital J. To, to him gave all the prophet witness throughout his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive the remissions of sins talking to gentiles while paul yet i mean while peter yet spake these words the holy ghost fell on all them gentiles the centurion's family and friends and house which heard the word they are listening and they of the circumcision gentiles oh yeah excuse me that's jewish people them of the circumcisions which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. What happened that afternoon? The centurion Cornelius and his family, and those of his friends who were invited when they heard Peter preach, I don't know if all of them, many of them going to say safely, believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, believed that Jesus Christ suffered and died according to the Scriptures, they believed he was buried. They believed that he arose from the dead the third day according to what God had done through him with the scriptures. And they are now written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, how's that? How's that for the centurions of the Bible? And God wondered when it, whenever Cornelius went to a... a went to a meeting of the centurions or went to the centurion reunion or had to have the centurion meeting or, or went out to the battle centurion, whatever it was. Centurions would have an opportunity to talk about Jesus, talk about Paul, talk about Peter. Here's one centurion that got saved. As much as he loved God, as much as he, God blessed him and his family got saved and he brought everybody to come and hear Peter, I guarantee he went to his centurion friends and told them about Jesus. Wonderful, great. 